Please give us an introduction about the Dream Chaser showcasing at CES 2022. What are its features? Oh, sure, I'd love to do that. So the Dream Chaser space plane is essentially a space plane. That's Sierra Space Corporation. We're launching our first mission with the Dream Chaser at the end of this year, at the end of 2022, about December timeframe. Uh, it's our first mission of seven missions to the International Space Station under a contract that we have with NASA. Um, the mission objectives are to deliver cargo, science payloads, maybe spare parts to the International Space Station, and also return the same complement of cargo like that to the ground. It's a cargo-only vehicle. It's not a uh, human-rated vehicle yet, but we've got plans for that as well. How about the Live Habitat program? Could you tell us more about that? How is it going to facilitate humans' moon colonization and Mars transport? Certainly. So the Dream Chaser space plane, think of that as a super important transportation infrastructure, uh, logistics infrastructure. Our Life Habitat is a destination platform in space. So the Life Habitat, and LIFE by the way, L-I-F-E, it's an acronym for Large Integrated Flexible Environment. The Life Habitat will essentially be an outpost in low Earth orbit at an altitude of between 400 and 600 kilometers. It's inclination of orbit will be 51.6 degrees, which covers roughly about 90% of the human habitated surface, surface of the Earth, it looks like a three-story building in space. Um, when it's fully operational, we can house about 10 people in, in the habitat, and we can configure it, we can design it and tailor it to do all sorts of applications, whether it's research, manufacturing, maybe working with the biopharma industry, but we also have some really creative and new ways of using the life habitat media, entertainment, advertising. Some people say the Dream Tracer program is like a miniature of the Space Shuttle program. We know that the Space Shuttle program has developed enormously but got cancelled eventually. So um, uh, is it a good reference for your company when it comes to both successes and challenges? We think it's a good reference in the sense that the concept of operations, the way that the Dream Chaser will be launched and the way that the Dream Chaser will return to Earth is very similar to the shuttle program. And we learned a lot from, from the heritage and the legacy of the shuttle program. However, we have achieved far better efficiencies in the way that the Dream Chaser space plane will function. Its reusability is, is very high. It's, it's um, um, turnaround time from one mission to the next very efficient. We can just do it in a few months if we needed to. So our cost to getting it on orbit is, is much less than what the shuttle is. So we think it's a, a far more efficient uh, way to accomplish missions in, in low Earth orbit. What are the similarities between the Dream Tracer program with aerospace programs developed in the U.S. as well as China and Russia? Also for Dream Tracer program, is there any competitor in China? Well, here in the United States, we have a number of competitors, and, and in, in the United States here, uh, NASA has done a great job in, in leading the commercial sector to develop new technologies, and specifically transportation technologies, through various programs, including the Commercial Resupply Program and the Commercial Crew Program, uh, where essentially NASA is no longer the service provider. They're not providing the rockets and the capsules and the infrastructure to do all of those services. They're actually buying those from the, from the private sector. So that's what the Dream Chaser space plane is all about. As a matter of fact, our, our NASA uh, seven missions are coming under the commercial resupply contract number two. And so under that, the private sector has been able to mature and advance technologies to a point now where they have actually outpaced what the government has done in the past and, and are providing transportation services, logistic services in space that we've never seen before. Uh, for both cargo and for crew. Um, competitors on the landscape right now, Northrop Grumman has been supplying the ISS for the better part of the last eight or nine years. SpaceX, we all know what SpaceX has done with their Falcon 9 and their Dragon cargo and, and crew capsule. And now Sierra Space, we're joining the fray with our Dream Chaser space plane, initially cargo. Very soon we will also have a crewed version of that. Uh, what we have seen coming out of other countries, China being one of those, they're advancing and being competitive in this arena too. We've just seen, as of late, over the last year or two, they've started to launch and assemble their own space station, for example. And they have their infrastructure, their transportation systems that are going to provide not only resupply of their space station in orbit, 
but they're also launching and returning their, their crew members, their Chinese astronauts up there. So um, competition from China's out there, and it's, it's good, it's strong. And we know that Sierra Space is working with Jeff Bezos' uh, Blue Origin developing commercial flights as well. Is there, uh, do you think that the public is ready for space trips, and when could we expect it to be more prevalent? So yes, I think the public is ready to fly. I, I, I view um, space tourism, space flight participation, space flight experiences, really as, as our industry now sort of raising the altitude of um, civil aerospace uh, 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 and, and public aerospace, right? I mean, if you think back to the advent of when commercial planes were flying people, right? It was a little scary, it was a little daunting, but people wanted it, the public wanted it, and as a result, industry responded. I think that's where we are today. I think right now the private sector is responding to demand of the public to want to go and experience space. And so I think that the technologies are out there for us to safely do that, and certainly Sierra Space is going to be part of that and, and compete. Sierra Space is collaborating with NASA for unmanned flights to the International Space Station starting this year. Tell us more details about this and what are Sierra Space future plans besides commercial? Absolutely. Uh, we are really excited about kicking off our contract with NASA with a fully operational flight later this year. Uh, we expect each mission we're going to deliver to the International Space Station just under 6,000 kilograms of um, research payloads, science payloads, uh, new technology development, uh, but also important resupply items, food items perhaps, um, uh, different types of uh, things that the crew needs in, in order to sustain their lives, lives on orbit. At the same time, another very, very important aspect of the mission, and it's unique with the, with the Dream Chaser space plane, is the ability to return those science payloads and cargo and maybe parts that need to be fixed from the ISS back to the Earth. Um, in addition to returning to Earth, we will have a capability to dispose of things that, that need to get off of the International Space Station because it's a, it's a closed, contained environment. You've got to take things off occasionally, right? If you don't take the trash out of the house, it gets messy. So we have the ability also to remove items from the ISS, put them into essentially what is a, you know, a trash bin, if you will, which becomes an incinerator, burns up in the atmosphere as it returns, but then the space plane returns to the ground with that cargo on board. We can return just under uh, 2,000, roughly about 1,500 kilograms from low Earth orbit to, to the surface of the Earth. Space is no longer a domain of the government. Do you see a faster growth and development in the commercial arena, both uh, technology and business-wise? I do. It's, it's a great point uh, that you just made, that the domain of space is no longer pinned up by governments. And I fully anticipate that we're going to see an acceleration of an advancement in the technologies that the private sector is able to do. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot more advancement in new customer demand and, and new, use, uh, new use cases, new applications, new products that are going to come out of these technologies that, that the private sector is going to be driving towards. And I think that we'll also see an increased rate of speed as to how quickly these new technologies and applications can be operationalized. I also think we're going to see a lot more participants uh, enter, enter the fray here. I think that the number of launches and the number of vehicles operating space from here into the next decade is really going to take off at an accelerating rate. How do you see the collaborations between the government and the private sectors? It's, it's vital that the government still be involved. I think that all nations around the globe, or most nations around the globe, still see a lot of strategic value and importance in maintaining a presence in low Earth orbit. I think that we certainly have that feeling here in the United States. We certainly want to, we have some national pride in maintaining what we think is U.S. leadership in that domain. I'm sure that other countries have a very similar feeling. I'm sure they have that feeling in China. And I think that competitive spirit and that national pride is actually a very healthy thing uh, globally. As I, as I said earlier in our conversation, I think there's a lot of collateral benefit from that healthy competition in, in wanting to advance technologies and, and presence in LEO. I think public-private partnerships, the private sector, providing good services and technologies to governments and the public sector is vital. I personally believe that the private sector can, can accomplish services and deliver products and technologies at a far more efficient, cost-effective way and also in a very uh, time 
uh, time-saving way. And I think governments can actually save and be much more efficient and, and be efficient with their taxpayer dollars or their government investment in these things and achieve higher re return on their investment, higher value from partnering with, with uh, the private sector. So I think public-private partnerships are going to be a huge component of all of this as we move forward. China recommitted itself to completing its orbit space station by the end of this year and says it's planning more than 40 space launches in 2022. How do you see China's technology and development in space so far? Is it comparable to the U.S.? And how do the U.S. preserve the domain in space? So I think China has done a great job over the last decade or so in, in advancing and accelerating their technology maturation and their ability to, to operate in space. And I think they want to continue on, on that pace, right? I, th I, I still think they have a lot of important national objectives and strategic objectives that they're going to pursue in a very uh, vigorous way. I think they're going to continue to try and develop their space station, that they're, they're going to try to continue to advance their technologies associated with the infrastructure to do more advanced research on their station. I think that's an important aspect for them, and I think they've done a great job. I think here in the U.S., we've also done a great job. I mean, over the last decade, NASA has, has turned more to the private sector, and I think our advancements in this domain, the domain of in-space operations, is now uh, being driven by and led by the private sector. I think that's different than, than what's occurring in China. I think what China's doing is still pretty much driven by the governmental systems there uh, and the governmental enterprises that they run. Whereas in, on our side, our governmental agency, NASA, is turning more and more to the private sector and, and having the goal of being a, a purchaser of these services from the private sector, uh, as opposed to NASA in the government domain standing up all of these enterprises, having to maintain all of this service, and that comes with a lot of overhead and costs that's, that's borne by our taxpayers here in, in this country. So from my standpoint as a United States citizen, I love the fact that our government agency, once again, public-private partnerships, it stimulates the economy, it stimulates employment, and I think it accelerates technology development. I think the private sector can do it faster. I think the private sector can do it more efficiently and effectively. I think the government and their requirements and their objectives benefit from that. The taxpayer benefits from it. We get more, more return on investment from our taxpayer dollars. So to sum that up, China's doing a great job. I think they're still pretty much government-led. I think U.S. is doing a great job. I think we're turning more to the private sector to lead us through, through the next several decades. Does Sierra Space have some collaborations with the U.S. Space Force? We do. Uh, we, we have some collaborations, not only with the U.S. Space Force, but other uh, parts of our Department of Defense. Some of them are in technology maturation. Some of them are, are even related to uh, uh, medical, uh, medical applications. Uh, so yes, uh, we actually have a long heritage and legacy uh, from our parent company, uh, Sierra Nevada Corporation, who has had a long-standing uh, history with uh, defense-related uh, programs for 30-plus years. And, and we anticipate that that will continue well into the future. It's an important part of what, what our mission is.